Today we have a invited speaker. I want to tell you a little bit about him before we get started. Mr. Hemus Sachs has been a principal technical staff member in the aerospace industry full time and adjunct faculty at UMass Lowell and Polytechnic of Brooklyn. Senior grade life member of IEEE and most recently has joined the physics and engineering department at Eastern National College. Um, Woody has modeled the physical systems of aircraft and space vehicles, flight control, radio inertial navigation, and the radar detection and orbit determination of space objects. His background and experience includes the analysis of feedback control stability and the determination of statistical filtering convergence. Mr. Sat's history also includes scientific consultation to industry, meaning a grant from NASA, the Small Business Association, to the research on global positioning system, navigation, and attitude determination of orbiting spacecraft. He was cited by NASA, by, by NASA for an innovative approach to phase ambiguity resolution in the design of GPS altitude determination. Mr. Haywood Sack received the Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering from SUNY and Master of Science degree in electrical engineering from Brooklyn, Brooklyn Polytechnic, along with several years of graduate research in the application of rational matrices and the near time and various systems to learn. So, without any further ado, let's go out of the Sacks. Thanks, Pierre. And Professor Cornelly invited me to uh, ask him what I should talk about, and he said I should talk about it in half hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what was the determination of space objects? Uh, where this comes from, uh, what I'd like to show is that uh, in the work that I've done in industry, uh, particularly trying to determine the, the motion of space objects and track them with radar. Uh, I've developed algorithms that would make the statistically best guess as to what the orbit was. And so what I immediately had my hands on was the development of the algorithm. And in the process, always wanted to have a suitable file of data that I could use to run through the algorithm to verify that it would work. And so uh, this normally required going after uh, other staff members to help and cooperate with me to provide these files of data. And uh, that doesn't always go smoothly, but uh, that's what I did. And uh, sometimes there would be a problem with understanding these data files and, and before they could be used, I would have to uh, have a number of things straightened out. Uh, on occasion, there was another complication to that process where the data might be protected, classified in which case, special handling. And then, uh, getting further into the background of the space object motion, I found out for myself that I could generate these orbits myself. And so then I would have enough data to run through my algorithms. And I could pick any orbit I liked, uh, set it up within uh, a very short time and just run it through. So, uh, uh, I'd like to show you here that uh, this process of orbit determination is uh, it's governed by a fairly straightforward, simple uh, equation that pretty much governs the motion of these objects. <clears throat> Is the problem with doing this the fact that you, you're trying to 
do it over with very little information about the orbit, so you're not watching it for three or four orbits, but you're just seeing the orbit for maybe a portion of its path. No, the, uh, the uh, verification of the algorithm that I would develop required me to go point by point, take a whole sequence of uh, radar measurements, and uh, maybe over a long period of time. So, uh, but the so uh, acquiring that file of time history of motion is the object. And uh, what I'm showing here, what I will show here, is that very simply, I can say, oh, I'd like this, or I'd like to perhaps launch an object from someplace on Earth and go to another place. And uh, very easily do it. Or, no, I really didn't want that. I wanted something else. Uh, a very short time later, I'll have that order. So that that's the, that was the object. The, physically, though, the file would be very large, and the data would be point by point, so that the sensor could ingest this data and, and make the statistically best guess. So, uh, what I'll show here is uh, what I'll. Review is the influences of the Coulomb and Newton uh, equations and describe the central force motion and uh, and show that the solution of those of that simple equation will generate a uh, a motion that uh, has the object moving on a in an elliptic contour. Uh, this was Kepler's great discovery uh, in his time when people looked at objects in space. They tried to fit the data that they observed to a circular orbit. Kepler found you know, that it was rather an elliptic orbit, and that really was a big advance. Uh, and uh, following along, uh, I'll show that uh, we can deal with that equation with a, a small approximation. We can get very far with it. And then uh, the latter charts will show the what a system of uh, object motion tracking is like. And what a, perhaps what a, a computer simulation of that process is. And, uh, and then, just before the summary, there is a, something very, very fortunate that shakes out of the orbit dynamics, uh, which can be used for uh, checking the numerical accuracy. So, this is, what, this is what I'm talking about. There's an object and its position from approximately from the center of the Earth, which is also one of the foci, one of the focus points of the elliptic motion. And I've shown the position and velocity, which, which will show up in the dynamics that I have in mind. We, we look at uh, radar detections and try to fit those to the mathematical model that I'll show you. And over a sequence of radar detections with the algorithm in place and the statistical optimizations being brought to bear try to determine what that orbit is. <clears throat> and this is uh, what the system would look like. The radar 
a large volume of detection processing computerized. And the, the algorithm that's going to try to separate the motion of the object, it has a couple of important components to it. And I changed color to emphasize a little bit the dynamics model. So um, when I when I want to determine the motion of this object, I look at measurements from the radar. There is a bit of random error involved. <coughs> the statistics will try to recognize that and account for it. In between measurements, I'd like the motion estimates to be smooth, and so that's where the dynamic model comes in. If I don't have the correct model, the algorithm will struggle. It will be very hard to get a good estimate. So I have a strong motivation to get the motion of that object uh, fairly correct. So the next point you're looking at when you have detection, next point you're looking at, are you predicting that next point? Or yes, that's right. I, uh, with everything that I have in an instant, I go forward with as much as I have then. And I like to, I go forward and then I can predict what the next measurement is going to be and compare it with what I actually observe at that time. The difference between those two would be the measurement residual. Okay, the, these, are, these are details that uh, would be nicely covered in my next presentation. <laughs> uh, I, I'll point out where they there will be charts to show where they occur. I don't have a lot of detail on that. So, but I put this up to show that I really, I uh, very much want to get that dynamics model. So, Coulomb, the Coulomb law shows that the force exerted on on an object uh, of lowercase m by uppercase m is proportional to the square of the distance separating them. I've got r cubed as a divisor, but I've got the, the position vector. And so one of those three r's will make a unit vector in the direction that we're interested in. Newton then goes ahead and says that uh, the rate of change of momentum is uh, balanced by that force. And so then putting those two together, <clears throat> where the, uh, the coefficient mu takes the constant from Coulomb and the, the larger mass, the, the Earth in this case, puts them together, and then finally, I've got the, the essential model of motion dynamics, which is the rate of change of velocity plus mu over r cubed times r, the position, is approximately zero. I've been somewhat intimidated by the uh, by the boards of the classes that you and Professor Fries have been teaching. Uh, and I told Pierre Richard just before we started that with that approximate zero, I uh, covered everything you said. Right, I just about covered everything there. <clears throat> now, th this of course wouldn't, it, it has uh, excluded perhaps uh, small amounts of aerodynamic force in, uh, in low altitude orbits where there would be some atmospheric drag. And also, uh, if the Earth was not perfectly 
homogeneous distribution of mass. Uh, very often, the, the, the first non-zero terms we see in, in, in this line of business are the, uh, the uh, spherical harmonics of a, a series that represents the uneven mass distribution of the Earth. <clears throat> So, so do, you, do you take so like the oblateness, and you don't take those in? Yeah, the the, um, the oblateness. Um, well, okay. Now I'm uh, not sure if I'm, I'm mixing up things. That, uh, the, uh, we've got the uh, the J one, two, and three terms, which I understood to be the spherical harmonics of. Uneven mass uh, and the oblateness, and including the oblateness. I may be, I may have that wrong. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so there are terms, but uh, for my purpose, uh, developing an algorithm and having a suitable time history of motion, uh, this is a reasonable approximation, and. Also, it really allows me to carry on and, and get very far with this equation. And uh, that's, that's the essential thing that I'm talking about here, is this equation. So, repeating it again, there are the motion dynamics. If I just simply take a, a vector cross product on the left, the position vector R cross into the motion dynamics, I'll end up with the rate of change of the cross product of position and velocity equal to zero. So, and that is uh, that is the uh, mass-free orbit momentum, which I've given the name H, and that is a constant. Uh, that's a big deal. I'll show you results from that. Now, there are the orbit dynamics again. This time on the right, I've got that constant that I just found, the uh, mass-free momentum. Pushing that through these equations, I uh, reasonably quickly get to the point that what's contained in those, in the brackets on the lowest equation. V cross H minus mu R over R, that too is a constant in time. And that is the first integral of uh, solving that vector differential equation. So now I have, I have the momentum as a constant, and I have this integration constant. Going forward with that, now I'm taking a dot product of the of the new constant that I just found. That will shake out and give me in uh, polar coordinates that the radial distance from the focal point of the ellipse is that form that you see. H squared, H is a constant, that's the magnitude of the momentum, and the mu is the, uh, the gravitational constant. Uh, one plus C over mu, another constant. Cosine of the true anomaly, that's a, one of the angles that can be seen in the polar coordinate system as the object moves on the elliptic contour. <clears throat> and so, uh, the ellipse being one of the conic sections, so we found that with the dynamics that I started with, that this is, uh, this is motion, that uh, the motion of governing the I'm sorry, the, <clears throat> the object's motion is following an elliptic contour. 
The second line. Yeah. Oh, I'm yes. Um, oh, and, no, no. Uh, right. I, I took. Yeah. The idea is that uh, starting with the the first line. D cross H minus B O R over R magnitude is constant. Now, the dot product of, of that entire thing, yes, uh, I see what you're getting at. That should be, yes, I have that wrong. <coughs> the, uh, the bracket is misplaced. Yeah. And the equals sign. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but I'm sorry about that. I'll, I have to check that. Uh, the, the point of that was to come properly to the conclusion that, that we have elliptic motion. Uh, right. That's the message down here. Okay. Uh, now the orbit. <coughs> If we get a, a successful estimate of, of the two vectors, position and velocity, any place in the orbit, that determines the entire orbit. Those six numbers, three position components, three velocity components, determines an orbit. There is another determination, another identification of the orbit, the Kepler parameters. In this picture here, have the orbit plane, there's the object, and it's going up and around. Uh, and so this point is the ascending node, and uh, the angle from it, and these are inertial axes. That's the Earth's spin axis, pretty much constant in space. And uh, this other direction towards the vernal equinox. <coughs> Uh, the six Kepler parameters that identify an orbit. A is the semi-major axis of the ellipse. E is the eccentricity, how much the ellipse differs from a circle. I is the inclination of the orbit plane relative to the polar Earth spin. So there's an inclination vector. The angle from the polar axis to that vector is would be this angle I. And then uh, uppercase omega is the ascending node. It, it's the angle measured to that. Uh, lowercase omega is the angle, the argument of perigee, so measured from here up to the closest point on the ellipse. And then finally, nu is the angle to the position of the object in the orbit plane. Another angle. <clears throat> and uh, so six quantities give you an, a unique orbit. And here, this is a lot of stuff, uh, just demonstrating that if I come in at the top with position and velocity vectors R and V, the inertial frame vectors, and their cross product, which is the mass-free momentum, then I just follow this sequence and get those six quantities that I just mentioned. Eccentricity, semi-major axis, inclination, ascending node, longitude, uh, periapsis, uh, perigee angle, and finally the true anomaly angle. So, so this, and I can also go back in the other direction. These are things that I 
typically have set up for myself if I'm working a problem like this and I want to get a file of data. I might start with this and say, well, I, I want this kind of an orbit. Let's go through this and it will quickly set it up for me. And then I have, I can generate that file of information. Uh, you have mismatched one of these. Things. Sorry, the, the E doesn't make sense. There's, some, there's something funny. Uh, oh, well, in the E term, though, there's something oh, funny. Oh, yeah. yes, right. This uppercase E vector is, uh, is uh, that particular form which, of which the magnet the magnitude of which is the eccentricity. Okay. Well, no, but I'm saying, I think that the, the parenthesis between R dot B times B, the parenthesis should be. Oh, yes. Yes. Good. Quite right. Okay. Uh, I, I, that's embarrassing. I, that's uh, the, the typographic checking here is not. I will check that. <clears throat> Now, here, so just to, some details. Uh, this, uh, this is more of a visual cue. Uh, I didn't expect to, to get uh, far into the details of statistical optimization and, uh, and the interpretation of the, the sensor observation model. Uh, What's indicated here is that uh, the measurement is going to be some nonlinear function of the state. X here represents a column vector of position and velocity. Uh, so the radar makes an observation. It doesn't see the state. If only it could, then we would be reading the, the, uh, the orbit directly. So we strive to get after that. Uh, so we start with the measurement, nonlinear function of the, of the state that we want. Then the estimate, uh, that's x with the star, the superscript. Uh, h is, that, uh, is the first variation of that nonlinear measurement. Uh, and then the estimation error. Uh, first variation, <clears throat> Here I have to do a, a bit of uh, fast talking to explain that when I go about doing the statistical optimization, I will be following a prescription where I need a linear, uh, a linear function of the observation. Having a nonlinear function, I can still manage but I have to linearize, I have to make an approximation. Uh, those are details that would be uh, best covered in another, another presentation. Uh, and then down here, again, these are uh, details that, would, that I would explain getting it further into statistical optimization. Uh, just, as I said, a visual cue to let you know that there, there is a, a certain amount of work behind getting the uh, radar measurements. <clears throat> this is perhaps more useful. Now here, this is the orbit dynamics model. That's something I have in my pocket when I set up a simulation like this. Here, the observation model, that would be the, the nature and characteristics of the radar. And one very big consideration is that it operates in a random noise environment. <clears throat> the green box, that's the motion estimation algorithm. That's where 
statistical optimization takes place. And then finally, they come out with, out of the green box, with an estimate of what the orbit is. Having this in my pocket, I had created that. I take a copy of it and compare with the estimate, and so that I can then have the estimation error. <clears throat> so, coming out of all of this is a time history of what those estimation errors would look like. Can I ask a question? Yeah. The random error, is that demonstrated to be the case? Or is it assumed to be the case because if it's not, that makes a lot of statistical analysis very difficult? Or? Um, mm. the, uh, the measurements certainly operate in a random and error environment. So that's known from the nature of the... Uh, right, that's, that's known and that's also experienced. That is... Uh, um, we could be uh, tracking an object with our particular sensor, and then we could go to another sensor network and find that we didn't get quite as much as we thought. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's an interesting philosophical question. How well, do I know? well does, does anything in your subsequent modeling and so on depend upon the assumptions of randomness? Like linearly squares depends on normal data, but the data is never normal, we just go on anyhow. Oh, yes. Yeah. seems to work. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Right. That's, okay. That, that is, um, that's the, um, the effort to create this. Um, and this, <coughs> in my presentation here, uh, I, I, I point to that and I kind of wait for that. Uh, another, another challenge is to have a very good model here. That's more what I'm focusing on. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, John, what you had asked me uh, before we started about the uh, those objects that we enter and experience atmospheric drag. Uh, if I try to proceed with what I have here, not accounting for the atmosphere, I would struggle. I, I would feel that it, it, it would be obvious that things were not working. Uh, so, uh, so that would be a case where this was not enough. Uh, here, tracking objects in Earth orbit uh, with that approximation, with the approximate zero. <clears throat> so what, what comes out of a computer program like that is the time history of those errors. So, uh, just to go back. Here are the errors comparing the true path from the orbitodynamics model with the best that the motion or the estimation algorithm could do. We end up with these. These are a number of different sample paths of error uh, that result from the algorithm straining to do its best. The algorithm also, one of the details of developing that algorithm is that it needs for itself to compute an estimate of the error, a, uh, a statistical estimate of the, of the error environment that it's in. And so it will generate a standard deviation, a, a one sigma uh, metric, a 
guess as to what it thinks the error is at that particular time. And then that's embedded in the details of the algorithm. The red envelope here shows the algorithm in action. It says, well, I think the error is so much. And it's on a one segment basis. So some of the errors will not be contained. Uh, here they are approximately contained. So when I have a uh, time history chart like this, as opposed to another where you could imagine the uh, sample paths way exceed the envelope. This one indicates that there is a consistency within the algorithm. It's making sensible estimates. It's got uh, its parameters adjusted properly, and it's uh, doing a reasonably good job of estimating the orbit and keeping the errors within where it thinks they are. Uh, are these times accurate, there's no scaling back for the, that would be 400 seconds in the orbit, or? Right, there's, uh, there's no issue I can think of about time. Uh, the time comes up as an issue in how frequently you take measurements and process them. And if you do it infrequently, sometimes that's insufficient. Yeah. I guess I'm just thinking of satellite goes around the Earth 90 uh, once in 90 minutes approximately, right. and you're, you're looking at a, a few minutes, so you're not, you're only looking at a small part of the path. Or... That's right. Um, this is a, just a, right. in low Earth orbit, uh, we have an hour and a half period. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, well, and for two applications I can think of, uh, I didn't talk specifically about just what this is. Um, in Earth orbit, we want to see and estimate long enough for the algorithm to converge. So that's 50 or 100 seconds in this case. Um, For re-entering objects, uh, it might be it, there might be a, a more critical time. We want to want to get that orbit quickly, so that we know very soon after we start looking that so this is uh, an object of interest. <clears throat> we. we I personally developed uh, code words to describe things without. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the level of security is, is quite. The students strong. have object of interest, but they think about something. The guys are thinking about something different. Yeah. I'm trying to keep it on. So, we can cover them all. Uh, so, now, I wanted to show this. Uh, very often, when we look at a time history that I just had, uh, sometimes I would get something that I didn't expect, and, and so the, the pressure would be on. Well, do I have everything straight? Do I have the computer program computing exactly what I thought? Is there some question about it? One question would be, about the motion dynamics. Now, that's the equation that <coughs> describes everything. What's involved here, imagine the velocity vector, three components, position vector, another three, a, a column matrix of six quantities that are solutions of a differential equation. We would then apply numerical techniques to solve that equation. And so uh, Rangri Kata 
fourth order Ramakana's big elaborate formula. It's quite a bit of work to solve that equation. And at the end of it all, it's a fair question to say, well, do I have that straight? And of course, my, my reflex is, uh, <coughs> I was very careful, I worked very hard. <laughs> this is right. Why is there a question? <laughs> right, right. So, so, going back to the mass-free momentum, we found that that was a constant. So then, I could take, at successive intervals of solution of the problem, h at t plus delta t, and then difference it with h of t, and then divide by its magnitude to normalize it. And what do I get? I should be getting numbers that look like machine round off. That is the, the threshold of the ability of the machine to hold numbers to a precision that you have in mind. And so uh, my understanding, my, well, my experience with uh, using MATLAB, for example, and uh, not taking extraordinary efforts to get a very super machine, uh, I should expect to get uh, 10 or 12 places of numerical accuracy. And uh, so th this, uh, I could plot a curve of that to see that indeed I'm getting that. And uh, to compute R cross V is a triviality in comparison with all the work that you did, that I did to solve that differential equation, that sixth order differential equation. Uh, just go in there, get that, fetch that quantity, and do this test. Simple and direct. It's available. I was explaining to Professor Cornelly that uh, sometimes when I view a presentation, I'm happy to see this particular view. <laughs> so, here's what we did. Uh, central force motion, Coulomb, Newton, elliptic motion, uh, constants, and we got to the first integral and then a little bit of the simulation, what it looks like, and uh, motion estimation, time histories, and that last few graph uh, numerical check. Um, and then I, in a different color, I, I suggested that perhaps what might be uh, interesting to the audience is to see a little bit of what's behind the statistical estimation of orbits, tracking of orbits. So, any questions? Can you go back to that chart with the, uh, the plot with the, the time history? So what you're showing here, so this, the red lines are one sequence? Is, is that what you're right. Okay. Right. And so you... This, the algorithm computes that itself. Yeah. This is its self-assessment, giving everything that it knows. It says, well, uh, not only am I making an estimate, uh, and the resulting error is the blue yeah. curve, but uh, I think it's as good as that. Right. And so when it contains most of the time histories, contains them 60% of the time or so, uh, yeah. things are it's a, it's a, I think it's the part that may be missing here, the first 50 seconds of history, you have all the things converging very quickly. Right? Yeah. And you have some errors 
there, but most yeah. of the within 50 seconds or less, even you're converging. Yeah, that's that's right. There are some errors that uh, this uh, uh, this is uh, cropped. Uh, <coughs> I broke the picture into the, so there are errors that far exceed, and we we expect in the beginning that. Uh, Things will not be as, as good. Yeah. Do, you, do you start out with just like uh, two two measurements? Like you need two to get velocity and position. Um, or, or do you start out with it, more? Yeah. Or in, in the least squares processing, you need to. It, it, it's based on a different set, and you need at least a certain number of point data points before you can make your first calculation. Uh, in statistical filtering, it's a little different. I mean, the two are very much the same. But in statistical filtering, you can take one measurement, and even though it's not enough to compute a least squares estimate, it's enough to make some estimate. So uh, you, you struggle a bit at the beginning. <coughs> So, uh, what are the units on the sidebar? Are they meaningful or is it just scaling? Uh, meters. Position error in meters. So, uh, uh, I guess uh, it wouldn't mean much unless uh, uh, unless I said, uh, well, we have a, a radar of this size and shape and dimension and capability. Yeah. Uh, at which point it would be very well asked me, well, how come it's such a large error? It should be better than that. Uh, so I didn't describe the radar in detail. Uh, and so, good. so the randomness, the randomness in the radar comes from atmospheric fluctuations or something. I mean, in an ideal world, the radar should be within a centimeter or a few centimeters right. or something. Um, okay, but this radar is looking up, so uh, it's, uh, it's going out you know, in sequence uh, as I can picture this. The first thing is it sees the thermal noise of looking into the sky. Um, another would be uh, Uh, atmospheric delay and, and, uh, and refraction. Uh, uh, looking for the right words. Uh, so there's a, a delay and then a ray bending. Yeah, uh, using the words. So you've got that, and then uh, let's see. At the object, at, so now you're going out, and then you reach the object. Uh, there could be some uncertainty or fluctuation of the object, which uh, perturbs things. Uh, so you, you know, you go and you you illuminate the object, and then you get a reflection. But the object is moving, of which uh, I believe in this particular case there was no account for a moving object. Assume it to be steady and. Mm -hmm. Um, so that there are a number of number of things that I could gather up to show that, uh, that provides that random error environment. Yeah, it's done. It's fluctuating. So you you limit, eliminate it. It returns many more points than what you would expect. The object is tumbling back. The radar reflectivity is not the same on all surfaces. Right. Changing right. aspect. So over time, you get variance. Yeah. 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 This this particular time history, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Exactly. Well, I, I think. Uh, well, I did the, the modeling for that. Uh, I assumed the. Uh, a stationary object. But, but, you know, but, yeah, it's, but generally, it, when the object is moving, uh, it's one of the uh, 
pervasive errors. If an object is moving and you don't know it, uh, or you don't model for it, it's, it's uh, quite a disturbance. It, it makes life very hard. But a lot of these errors, most of them we can resolve them within, you know, for example, the wave energy. Yeah. Here, yeah. We, we, we measure it here, so but we can resolve that, right? Yeah. We, right? Well, it, uh, the uh, tropospheric uh, refraction, that, that error is uh, pervasive in that, uh, you know, the, the uh, process is ongoing. So an object comes into view, you look at it, and you're looking at it at different elevations. Yeah. And with each one, there's a different number, which, you know, if I properly model that, I would have all that. So the algorithm is dealing with uh, an error that uh, not only is there a random characteristic, but there is a, a time-varying aspect that was not modeled at all. And so that, that makes it a pretty hard one. Would it, would it be possible to think of the dynamics equation as an as equation with parameters and simply do a nonlinear least squares between that and the observations? In other words, don't do a dynamic calculation, just treat it empirically. Is that one thing I have in mind is because you talked about the, uh, the drag not being present. No. So in cases where there is drag and not drag, I would think you would see a significant difference in the statistical ability to model just oh. straight out empirically. Yeah. For one thing. Well, he, uh, <coughs> regarding uh, drag re-entry objects, so they start with the, the motion that I have, and you have an algorithm in place. Now, to have an algorithm in place means to have selected a model of motion dynamics. You try to track that object, and as it enters, you quickly realize that things are not going well. Uh, what to do? Uh, first thing is to say, well, okay, drag is a, I can augment the space object motion with drag. That gets you a, a fair amount of success. You can, you can track for longer and further. Finally, when you, when you get in close, uh, that, model, that, that algorithm struggles as well. And uh, if the object is maneuvering, uh, now you, you don't, it, it's not possible to know. Uh, if, uh, if the adversary or sportsman-like, it would tell you what maneuver he needs to do. So, absent of that, uh, you say, well, okay, what can we do? As it turns out, when you say, uh, okay, don't specify the, uh, well, in a case like that, we have no choice. We do not know. We absolutely do not know what the model is doing. We can't say that it's random because it is, it's deterministic unknown. Mm -hmm. And as such, the only way to keep up, up with the track of that object is to increase the frequency of observation. And that, that gets you some facility with determining that object motion. But uh, at that point, it's really Everything is very hard. Uh, not much can be expected. And the only hope really is uh, high frequency track. Do we need the radars to adopt our ship to try to get a little more information? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the 
the Doppler measurement is uh, simply to uh, illuminate the object uh, multiple times and to uh, fit uh, to fit that uh, those multiple points of observation to get the Doppler measurement. So you you're essentially getting a you know, a range rate measurement. It's always line of sight range rate kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> well, I didn't show the details, uh, but that turns out to be uh, not too much different from just going ahead with uh, range observations. Uh, in a radar, range is particularly accurate. Cross range is uh, uh, hopelessly poor and um, efforts are made to take advantage of that knowledge um, to improve the situation. Uh, specifically, the systems use like multiple radars to try to, to, try to narrow that down? Yeah, that, that, would, that would help. Uh, you know. Yeah, they, so the, these are multiple uh, operations that they need to, to improve. But so, so most of the time you don't have a chance, right? You don't have a choice. You got this sensor and you ties with tracking oh. this target and you need to track it. So yeah. the only thing you can do is, you know, eliminate it more, right? Because you don't have anything else, right? In some cases. Yeah. 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 So Redbird chill the uh, early morning in, in Europe and uh, going to put it in Alaska now because we're worried about Korea. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, that, that's... Um, I've... Um, well, in industry, uh, we've worked on things like that. Uh, but uh, as I... Uh, alluded to before, uh, the level of security is really, really something else. Uh, data is restricted, but uh, conversation is restricted. Words. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember seeing some of that in the news. Okay, I'll put on my chemist hat and ask a dumb astronomical question. The mass of the moon does not appear in your dynamics, so apparently oh. it's too far away, et cetera. To that was in the um, in the, uh, the wavy approximate uh, approximation of zero. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was. I should guess that. <laughs> that, that was uh, neatly uh, neatly separated. One thing I really liked about the way you did that is you, you talked about why you want to, that this applies to zero, there's this and that and the other thing. But making it exactly zero does things to allow you to proceed. Oh, yeah, I, I got that, the... That's, that's a very important concept, I think, for the students to, to hear this. Right. You may have to make a correction later, but you can proceed. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, I, if I had, well... Person, the personal problem was, okay, I need a file of data. Uh, oh, well, so call up so-and-so. You know, first thing is, okay, uh, let's be optimistic. I'm going to get cooperation and help from my colleagues. Uh, he will understand the questions I have, and I'll understand the guidelines he gives me to interpret the data, to understand the format, all of that. Uh, then the next thing, which uh, nobody can be blamed for, is, Hey, look, this is classified data. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so, so to be able to just, you know, I can, uh, you know, I remember we had a conversation uh, in the cafeteria once in a briefing room where uh, someone said, well, we can get around the classification data. Uh, let's have a missile that's uh, launched in Paris and is aimed at Brooklyn, New York. Uh, 
I said, oh, that's top secret. <laughs> I was being silly. Uh, but so to be able to just generate what I need at any time of the day, no problem. I know the format. You can, you can actually, you can get away with neglecting those terms because you're only in such a short segment of the orbit. Like if you if you add the moon in, you know, you still get an ellipse, but you get an ellipse is just kind of precessing. And so if you're only looking at sort of one pass, uh, you know, yeah. Not much yeah. 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 Ye